Welcome everyone to the Reseller Island podcast. Uh, this is our first time having a guest on with both of us. So we want to welcome the One Foot Flipper on to the island with us. Um, today, we want to discuss a pretty controversial topic, which is how much does our area actually affect our success on eBay reselling? Um, I just mentioned this to the guys 90 seconds ago, right before we went live. So there's no pre-discussion about this. We're just going to share our unfiltered opinions on the subject. It may turn into a discussion. It may turn into an argument. We may all agree. Uh, but I'm hoping that this can be a valuable episode for you guys. So, Paige, let's start off with you. Just a blanket statement that we will get dive much deeper into. Does your area affect your success on eBay? Oh, it, 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 it is absolutely huge. And it can be even huger once you combine it with what, if you have a specialty, your specialty and your area combined can be a massive thing. So, yes, I think it's huge. Yeah, lately it's been pretty rough now that I'm getting back to thrifting since I've been thrifting in a while, getting organized. And I've probably gone maybe six times to good, to a certain good – two Goodwills each – and savers around four times and i'm only coming out with maybe two items and it's vegas has plenty of stuff but it's getting harder to find things for glass and hard goods so Paige, you said it's a huge uh difference maker does huge what what does that mean exactly is area more important than skill set and knowledge or is it less no, important than that? No, area is not more important than skill, but with the amount of automation that keeps happening and the way things keep getting easier, you know, you could point your phone at something to find out what it is. Mm -hmm. Skill is mattering less and less than what we do every year, which is unfortunate. But yeah, areas, big, like if you're talking about thrift stores, some places just have better thrift stores. From every video I've ever seen, uh, Deseret Industry thrift stores are much better than the Goodwills in the Missouri area are, or if you're, you know, if you're in rural Arkansas and you're wanting to specialize in high end men's clothes, you're going to have a hard time doing that. You mean Arkansas? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you just, you just said an interesting statement that I want to revisit. So you think skill is becoming less and less important as, as we move on. Uh, ten, 10 years ago, let's say you're a book specialist. Mm -hmm. You actually have to know what you're doing. Now you can go and scan 80% of the books on the shelf and find out whether or not they're worth any money and you don't have to know anything. Now, knowing something is still useful because it'll allow you to pull things things without barcodes quicker. You don't have to look, look them up or anything else like that. But yeah, the ability to scan barcodes easily and now the ability to take a photo of that item and, and actually identify it. I mean, that's huge. And that takes away from people who have actually learned that stuff the hard way. You know, you, you could go out and take a new person and just teach them how to scan barcodes and how to take pictures of things with the eBay app. And they're going to have a huge advantage over wherever we were when we started. I actually had to know something when I started. Yeah, for me lately, I think the only thing I've been using is Google Lens. But I know um, Paige in his recent video said that he is big on tools. So that matches up with what he just said. Yeah, so I'm actually, I'm actually going to counter that um, with, uh, I think that being able to correctly identify and understand the nuance of selling items is nuance. a tough skill to acquire as well. Because you can go in and you can scan an item at Ross and then be like, oh, sweet, this is only $4 and it's selling for 25 so I'm going to buy it. But then you don't see that there's 27 listed and there's only one sold. So you have to learn the skill of actually identifying the demand and the sell through rate. And then you have to understand also the nuance of, is this a, pro is this a product that is racing to the bottom? Or is it a product that actually will maintain the demand because maybe this company is going under and that's why there's a surplus of this item at Ross? is a major influencer stepping into the game here. And so there's going to be a huge surge in this product. Or is it just one that truly Walmart and Dillard's could not sell? So it's here on the shop, here on the on the shop, here at Ross. So I think I think that scale actually plays a huge part moving forward. And I think that we will be separated 
by how we are able to identify nuance within each within each category and each item. You're right. There's a lot of people that will show you say even this has been happening a lot now that I'm sourcing more at flea market, the swap meet here and at thrift stores, people saying, oh, look what this sells for. And the first question I reply to is, is that a, a, a listing or is it an actual sold? Mm -hmm. And they have all 100 percent lately have been saying, oh, let me check. And they're like, oh, yeah, it doesn't sell for that much. And they get super excited about these prices. And that's what tends to get people in that little bubble of you should know better and take that few seconds to see if it's worth getting rather, rather than investing on something, say, at Goodwill. The only way you get refunded for it is through credit if it's an electronic. Everything else, that's on you. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, Jake, I, I agree with you that this skill is greatly helpful. And uh -huh. now I've lost where I was there for a minute. But that's one reason why I don't do retail arbitrage, because one thing that can be hard to tell is, will that item have gone to zero in two days after you've got it? Because every Walmart in the country was clearancing that item out. Yep. And that, that is very hard to know, or I'm, I don't know if it's impossible to know. Well, Jake's in the retail arbitrage. What, what would be your best thing to do? Just be there first thing in the morning, list it as fast as possible? Yeah. So, best bet, right? Yeah. So the majority of our audience is uh, used condition vintage eBay resellers. Uh, so we'll talk more about that, but I'll dive into retail arbitrage a little bit quickly here. Um, there is so much nuance in the game of retail arbitrage. I wish, uh, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry that there's so many YouTube accounts with beards. Uh, I think Scott is Bearded Picker. Um, I wish, Bearded Picker hasn't made a non-live video or non-podcast video in like four or five months, but he's a really awesome resource when it comes to retail arbitrage because he understands this magical thing that I like to talk about called nuance. He knows he, he just by his experience and by data in front of him, he can understand when things are going to zero or when things have a high demand now or things that will get a huge spike and then they will come down and then they will resurface back in six months or eight months. He's really good when it comes to that side of things. When it comes to retail arbitrage, I think that um, I think you just have to be extremely skilled. I think that retail arbitrage people come in and they scan away and they see the potential of it and then they buy too much and then they don't understand which items will maintain value. And then they're done reselling because they bought $1,600 worth of Barbies and some guy in South Carolina and Las Vegas and Kentucky and Florida also bought $1,600 worth of Barbies. And now they can only sell it for $8.99 free shipping yep. instead of $24.87 that they saw previous. Uh, that's why the, what little retail arbitrage do I do, I keep it only limited to my absolute area of expertise, which is tabletop games. Like I go into miniature market maybe once a month. They've got this clearance section and I ignore 90% mm -hmm. of it. But some things I just have at a dollar or less. And I buy all of that because yeah. Yeah, that, that's yes, that's currently a product that has zero value. But I found if I just throw it in a drawer and I list it in two years, it does have value then. All those the investor. <laughs> well, here's the, here's the thing. If I buy a pile of stuff like that, I only got to sell one item to make all my money back. And that yeah. always works out for me. But I'm otherwise, I am not risking risking buying things that can go to zero or can end up at, oh, yep, it's $8.99 free ship and it costs, and it weighs four pounds. Because mm -hmm. that, that happens a lot in, in tabletop gaming. Like these board, big, fancy, expensive looking board games just will flop. And it'll literally be available for the cost of shipping for years. And I've been stuck with some of that stuff for years. Yeah. Well, we can say the same thing about retail arbitrage in used condition items as well. Um, an awesome example of that are digital cameras. So I haven't been around on eBay too long, but I talked to other influencers and other resellers who have been in the game a lot longer than I have. And the recommendation was to not even touch digital cameras seven or eight years ago. Uh, they just, they wouldn't sell on eBay. If you have the right model, you're going to get good money for it. And it's going to move relatively quickly, but it's just not going to move for you. Now you can't keep digital cameras. Uh, they just sell so fast. I think if you just look up PowerShot Canon 
I mean, PowerShot camera. I think just that search has over a 600, may, maybe like 300% sell through it. Uh, there's only probably 12,000 listed, but there's over 36,000 sold. No, it's it, not going to be a 300% sell through rate in 2030. It might, it might be even faster. I'm predicting it's going to be extremely slower though. Uh, now, is that because people aren't buying new digital cameras anymore for the most part? Is that why the used market is so on fire? Yeah, you can't really, you can't really find, you can't really find them at. So you used to be able to buy like the Elf 180, uh, which is Tech and Sports and Daily Refinement made that the most popular camera in the reselling world. Um, that's what they recommended for everyone to take their photos, and they stopped selling that at Best Buy in like 2019. So now you can't even buy these digital cameras at retail places anymore. You have to go online to get them. Uh, so that also increases the value of them. Also, there's like 17-year-old girls on Instagram and TikTok right now that use these cameras and it's trending. And so the influence is really hot in them. So that's why they're also selling as well. But in two years, they could be back down to a 40% sell-through rate and no one really wants them except for true collectors that love cameras. Yeah, it's more like a, a fad. It comes and goes. It's not really a thing that lasts forever like that. I think the biggest thing that's going to change for cameras is going to be because of the quality of them, of the mirrorless. The only reason I started getting into cameras myself is when I went to college and got a degree for it, for photography. So it's always embedded in me sense of looking at cameras, whether it be film or digital. And the small ones are always one that I would see at the time when I was looking at cameras why can't I just use a point and shoot? I learned very fast my first day of class that a point and shoot is not going to work well in photography, but that's me not knowing any better. But as something that has been a bad experience, but something good for me to see what is worth getting for something that I want to make use of um, and what I want to do with social media. So I, I still look for them. And I always have since 2000, what was it when I went to school? 11. So, but it's becoming less and less of me finding them though. I'm actually feeling I need a camera now myself. I got an iPhone 15 now, but the nice. problem is the pictures are great, but you know what? They don't show, I plug it into the computer and they don't show up right away on the storage space of the iPhone. Like on my old, old one, I take the pictures there immediately on the storage space. Do you, do you batch photos and then list on the desktop? Yes. Yeah. So I'm having to carry my old phone around with me to take pictures too. So I'm not waiting a random 15 to 20 minutes for the photos to show up. Yeah. Yeah. But there's just, uh, I don't know. I think when it comes to reselling, especially used condition items, I think a lot of skill comes into play when you're also giving the condition of the item. Um, so there's a lot of items, even like, so Sonny can probably speak on this. There's a lot of glass items that are worth $600 cracked, um, you know? And then there are amazing looking exquisite pieces that you would think, oh, this has got to be worth a couple hundred dollars, right? Zero, zero sold, 18 listed for $19. So when it, comes, when it comes to selling things online, I know we talked about how there's a lot of nuance to retail arbitrage. Um, and I think there's just as much when it comes to selling used items because there is still race to the bottom and there is, Sonny, just speak on, speak on some glass nuance for us real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so I was about to turn around and grab some because look, looks are one thing. Yeah. You could have something be nice and shiny just like this. Oh, this is a beautiful Josefina Kronos, uh, Kronos as in Poland. Um, and Josefina is not a female, it's a guy's name. And you could see this and you see some go for like 120, 160. And then the value of it isn't there. It's it's more of like, it's more of the follower of the person that's more into it or just loves the style and not so much of like a all around glass collector. So this will probably only go for like 40 bucks, but then I have smaller versions that could sell for twice as much that look nothing like this. So cameras in general, to me, are more of and glass or like popularity. You have people that love Murano, and then you have people that are looking for just Baccarat. When it comes to cameras, is more of like, are they a Nikon person? Are they a Canon person? Or Sony? And then you have all these little things that differ each other. So value is more of, uh, again, the person wanting it compared to who may not even be bargaining for bargaining for things. Yeah. 
But yeah, back to back to the original discussion of how much does your area matter in reselling? So I am a strong believer that let me talk about the average American. The average American has a car. The average American has a smartphone and the average American has access to Wi-Fi. Just those three things alone really mute the importance of area. Area is still important, obviously, but it really mutes that because of a lot of different resources that those technologies bring to us. Now, I want to talk about the person who, you know, has nothing. You can still go to, you can still go to McDonald's and use their free Wi-Fi. Uh, you can go to a Goodwill and you can get a decent laptop for $15. You can really, really bunker down and change your life financially and save up $600 to go get a 19, 1998 Neo Prism. And you can start driving to these thrift stores and these garage sales and you can change your life. But it's super difficult at the beginning. And I feel like it's the beginning that kills us. The average person starts and stops, starts and stops, starts and stops their whole life. And if we would just stick to things for a little bit longer using the resources that technology has given us, we just have, we just have so many advantages because of our car, our smartphone, and our access to Wi-Fi. I would say that makes sense. Yeah. I, I used to, when I did more cards, I used to play a game. Every time I'd sell a valuable Pokemon card, I would go through, look through lots of Pokemon cards that were recently listed and try to buy a lot that had the same card in it for half of what I just sold the single card for. I was usually successful, but it was such a time sink that I eventually yes. stopped doing it. But, you know, if I had a better eye for it, I could probably, you know, do it five times as fast, too. Of the last 500 items that I have listed, um, Probably 270 of them have come from eBay. I bought them off of eBay and I'm listing them back onto eBay for a profit. Uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter where I lived, I would be able to do that, which is awesome. Um, and, and shipping is, I know that we, I know that we complain about shipping because it does keep going up um, faster than inflation and it does suck and it eats into our margins and stuff. But if we actually think about how incredible it is that we can send a 42 pound receiver from Maine all the way to California for under $40. That's really an incredible feat. If you think about all of the distance between that logistics. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so whether I live in the middle of the country or Maine or San Diego, or even Juneau, Alaska, shipping is so affordable that you can get video games to your door, wherever you live in the country, you can get sunglasses, you can get Anything that you sell on eBay, you can get it off of eBay or off of Amazon or off of Kohl's.com or off of Target. Um, all of these resources are made available to us. And I think that takes away a little bit of my area is what's holding me back. I've always liked to come back to, um, you know, I've been reselling for a while. When I want something new, like say a new iPhone, I always use reselling to help me get there rather than digging into the money that I already have to just have me create new goals to thrive store uh, thrive for and not just say I could get it because I can. I like to work towards it. And for me, you said you have an iPhone 15. I have an iPhone 12 Pro Max and I use that for my daily vlog channel. I use that a lot now for my thrifting videos. And you're right, Jake, it's it's make use of with what you have. And if it's not enough, then you should work towards something uh, to earn, say, like us reselling to get it. And just because it's new, doesn't mean it's always best. It's just like getting the new updates on the iPhone. It's not always best because they have bugs and then now you're having hiccups. I'd rather wait a few months and then check it out afterward, after they've already cleared all that stuff out. I actually can't tell the difference between my new one and the old one, except that the screen is bigger. Otherwise, I yeah. can't tell exactly what it's doing for me. I'm, I'm recording on the newest iPhone and then I have the second newest iPhone. And when I do videos, I can't, I can't tell the difference. So... But yeah, uh, Paige, let's talk about thrift stores. Uh, let's talk about thrift stores in St. Louis compared to Utah, compared to Las Vegas, compared to Kentucky, compared to North Carolina. All right. Carolina. Well, St. Louis area, uh, Murr's Corporation runs all our Goodwills. And two things, the prices are incredibly high. They pick everything that they think of value and either mark it up way high in the store or they send it, uh, send it to online auction. 
I basically, it's not worth my time to walk into a Goodwill here. Now, it might be better if I was actually waiting to run inside the second that they opened or opened or whatever, but it's not worth my time to walk into it. However, they also unload countless stuff to the bins without it ever having hit the store floor. Yeah. Because I'd probably say 80% of the stuff I see in the bins doesn't have a price tag on it, which means it never hit that store floor, right? Yep. So let's let, let's talk about a really narrowed, um, cool thing that we have. You, James, and Marcus Dixon all live in the same area. I, I think I think you and James are probably pretty close, and then Marcus is a bit farther out. I think he, uh, like, James is about ten or fifteen miles away from me. He 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 lives in the better neighborhood than I do. <laughs> okay, so so you guys so you guys are really close, and then Dixon's picks and Di oh man, I always I, that's always a tongue twister for me. Dixon's Pickens. Um, I believe he lives like an hour and a half out of out of uh, St. Louis, from what I understand from his videos. I watch I watch a lot of his videos. Everyone go check out them. Um, everyone go check out those two accounts. I really I, I watch both of them. Yeah, Marcus is very organized, and he is yeah he is a go getter. He definitely. So is. so to your point, Paige, mm -hmm. all three of you, and this is purely an anecdotal. All three of you guys are what I would call bin sellers. None of you, I mean, I'm sure you guys all go to Goodwills from time to time. And I don't want to speak for any of the three of you, but it like to what you are saying, none of the none of you three go to the traditional brick and mortar thrift stores often at all. And so it sounds like you may have some proof in the pudding there of like, you know what, the thrift stores in St. Louis do suck. And if you're thinking about making a full-time living from Goodwill here, you better move somewhere else or reconsider, right? Right. Because yeah. at, at the bins, I see the same people. And there's more than just me and James and the other one here. There's a couple others whose names I can't remember who are actually yeah. bigger than me. And they're, they're not at the thrift stores. They're at the bins every single day. So that leads to another point of your area may suck for thrift stores. But it doesn't mean that you can't be a good reseller. Um, all three of you make at least the majority of your bills reselling full time, all that good stuff. And you continue to do so independent of your area is, is what is what I'm saying, because even though the thrift stores may suck. And I, I truly believe that um, you would be able to get pretty good items from those thrift stores as well. It's definitely not going to be with a lot of frequency, maybe as, as a different location in the United States. But I still think that you can go to any thrift store in the country and find a few things at least per week that you can make a comfortable margin on. But there is there a lot of a lot of what I am saying is, yeah, maybe your thrift stores do suck. But if you are trying to build a business on one income stream, I think that's where a lot of people run into the issue and fail. There isn't a profitable bit the profitable business out there that has only one income stream or one supplier. Right. I, I like I like I don't just do the bins. Actually, my biggest suppliers are actually me buying entire collections from people. I just haven't mm -hmm. bought a big one in a year. But th that's what I prefer to do. I prefer to drop three grand one time, get twenty to thirty thousand dollars worth of stuff. I'm not actually when I when the collection's really big. I have actually have no idea how much it's going to actually be worth in the end. Because it's just impossible to tell, you know, what is this entire van load of, you know, gaming stuff going to be worth? Who, who knows? Mm -hmm. But I, I will drop that three thousand to get to get I know a bunch. That's what I prefer to do, but that doesn't show up every day. Yeah, unfortunately. So I got. Are go you ever able to hear my car horn or somebody's car horn? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. it's freaking loud. Yeah, it's like it's like that engine across the street that I that is on almost every podcast, but everyone else says they can't hear it, so that's good. Good. Uh, if I yeah. was forced to use the thrift stores, I would hit, I would skip, I would not hit the Goodwills as often. I would hit the alternate ones. There's one we call the old lady thrift store. They'll actually haggle with you, but there's no sense in going in there more than once every two weeks because their turnover of items is so absolutely low that I'd be wasting my time going in there on a daily basis. And sometimes I'm going in there and seeing the same stuff that'll be in some places that has been there for two years. Mm -hmm. They just don't turn it over. But just on an hourly basis, I found walking into that Goodwill is not worth it on an hourly. Not if I have any other option. 
Actually, I'm gonna test that with somebody else. Go out with somebody else, and we'll spend an hour in the Goodwill, and then we'll spend an hour searching dumpsters. And Dude, see dumpster pe people listen. Dumpster diving is actually incredible. Like I, I don't, I don't do it a lot. When I first started eBay, just as kind of like a fun thing, you know. I'm like, oh, I got a little bit of extra time. Me and my friend that was my employee at the time, we just go dumpster diving and we go make some good, some good money. Just uh, searching through dumpsters. But uh, talk to us a little bit about the scene in Vegas for thrift stores, honey. Scene in Vegas? Well, Goodwill prices are going high. It's like three ninety nine for a t-shirt. What's crazy is like, yeah, you might find some brand new tags, but it might not be something worth getting. The jeans are now minimum of $9.99. And if in certain Goodwills, if you have Levi's anything, missing crotch, missing leg, it's going to be $19.99 up to $24.99. So for me, apparel has been something I've been getting away from and getting into glass. Um, and then even that, there's some things that I'm finding with hard goods that I'm getting more into that isn't worth it for me. So knowing that, I still go inside there because you know what you know and the skill set comes in of not using my phone as much to where I'm in and out within maybe 15 minutes if I wanted to. Making a, a video, I tend to take a little longer because I want to share some knowledge and stuff. But my best source lately has been the swap meet here and the flea market. It is getting super hot. And because of that, vendors aren't getting as much customers. And going on Sunday, the last day, they want to get as much money as they can. So I'm getting, I'm getting better deals and yeah. finding items for a lot less than what I would have paid for, say, two items, getting four to five items at these two other places than thrift stores. So if, if I'm hearing correctly from you guys, I'm hearing you guys highlighting difficulties and things specific to your areas that stand in the way of you succeeding on eBay. But if I'm hearing correctly, I hear that you guys are just getting over that and pivoting and going to a different source or increasing knowledge in a different category or, or doing other things to succeed. So if I'm correct, what, what do you say to the people that say, well, I've tried everything and just nothing works. I just can't, there's just nothing I can do. My area limits me from making money. Is, is that true? Is, are there areas out there that it's like, Oh yeah, I've done everything. I just can't make money here. Or do we, do you guys think that maybe, these these sellers just haven't tried enough things or, or increased their knowledge enough i don't think anybody's tried everything yeah. at all you could live you know somewhere in nevada 50 miles from a test site and they're nowhere else yeah. yet you still if you work social media good enough, and not eat and also not even buy anything off ebay if you work social media good enough you could get people to send you collections of things and you could sell it it's yeah. like if you wanted to do magic cards, it's very easy. You just pay six. You just find out what the stores are currently paying. Pay two percent more. People will send them to you, and you know you don't even have to go looking for them. So that there is always a possibility, no matter where you live. Yeah, yeah. Stepping outside your comfort zone too. If something isn't working, like say apparel, which I was into for four years. And that started really dwindling down. I then started looking at, it was still apparel, but it wasn't t-shirts or jackets. It was jeans. And that right away, within a few minutes, I found my first Japanese uh, salvage jeans for like $7 and they sold for over a hundred. And then I was like, what else can I find that's worth getting? So that got me into jeans. And then when that got lower and trying to find some really, or finding good items, I started getting into sporting goods. And then fast forward to three years ago, that's that's when glass came along, vintage jewelry. And I've just evolved as things have become more of a suck to something that's better, that's that's promising and something I enjoy doing. Because in the beginning, I was like, I'm an apparel seller. Um, I'm a content creator. So I felt like I, I made too much of a niche for myself and made these policies that nobody cares about, that I was stuck in this realm of like, I could only find T-shirts. And then when I got out of it, realizing I, I need to stop doing that and making these stupid rules for myself and open up to more things and be open because being a content creator, too, is more about experimenting with what you want to do and not so much of just throwing stuff against the wall and seeing if it sticks. For example, my last video being a reselling content creator, I didn't buy anything at the thrift store. And it's one of my best videos here yeah. recently without buying anything. So how could mm -hmm. you be a reselling content creator without buying anything it's knowledge and that's the other part of me being a content creator is not just what i buy it's what i'm sharing and my input of what people 
may relate to or not because you want both sides for it to be a really good video. So it was pretty good and something I've been wanting to work on because we don't always find things. But how do you share that and how will people take it? Don't worry about it. Just do it, in my opinion. Yeah, and that's that's a compliment that I have for the One Foot Flipper channel. Uh, you you put out very consistent and very relative content about reselling, but then you're not afraid to be like, you know what? Let's talk about pizza. <laughs> right. Let's, <laughs> Let, let's do a video that has that has a little bit of reselling sprinkled in, but it, it's actually just about pizza. Yeah, and and you, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna rap about I'm gonna rap about other reasons. You know, just things like that. It, it's good to like just explore those realms. Well, be, being that when I'm really going at it, I want to do four videos a week and that I don't do any sourcing videos. Mm -hmm. and, and really, I've only been selling part-time lately. Even selling part-time, I still make as much as my wife, so I feel like I'm doing great. Yeah. I mean, if I want to do four videos, I got to research and come up with some stuff. So yeah, I will do an entire pizza about videos. I'm sorry, an entire video about pizza. I will do an entire video about Beastie Boys merchandise. It, it And some people want to see it and some people don't. And that you you earn people click on it or they don't. It's no worries, just just putting content out there. But I want to revisit uh, this thrifting thing again because, especially on TikTok, man, it get, it gets wild over there. If you guys want some some negative comments or or people that have just uh, given up, go head over to TikTok. <laughs> the most like probably so I get a lot of really common comments. One of the most common is. My thrift stores aren't like this in Florida. Not in my area, literally Florida. Carry American Arbitrage is moving to Florida to be more successful in reselling. Philly Flipper moved to Florida. Um, ADH Dave did the same Philly thing. Like, people are literally moving to Florida to be more mm -hmm. successful. Yet, and maybe maybe they didn't just move to Florida to be more successful in reselling. There's other things pulling them. I feel like I'm talking for a lot of people in this episode, and I really I really hope that no one thinks that i'm talking for them or anything like that just just how i how i perceive things but it's just so wild to me that people say florida is the worst state for reselling rally roots is killing it tech and sports is killing it captain nurse flipper is killing it adh dave is killing it like all of these people in florida are killing it yet it's the worst state for reselling in a lot of people's minds and that's what really that's what really just nails in my philosophy about this that like it is more and I, I and i really hate to offend people when i say this but i know it does i really think it is much more the seller than it is the area why you can't succeed especially because of your car and your smartphone and your wi-fi but back to the thrifting and i i every time i go thrifting in vegas i, I hear a lot of terrible things about vegas and i just i I slay in Vegas. I really, I, I don't know, like in thrift stores, in Savers, in Goodwill, in Salvation Army, and the DI. Everywhere I go, I just find stuff because I peruse a lot of categories. I take my time and I really look things up. Um, again, I hope no one gets offended by me saying this, but I, so I go thrifting and John Flippin' and Easy comes along and he admitted this on a live. So like, I don't know how Jake goes in there and just finds so much stuff. Me and Jake and Archie, we're all looking at the same stuff and I'm leaving with one thing and he's leaving with like 19 and they're all fast sell through rate items that, you know, so I, I and I, I don't want to come across as like I'm the best thrifter and I'm better at this job than other people. But I really just think if, if more people just took away their bias and said, you know what, my human biology is telling me that I need to complain to survive. I need to put myself in a comfortable position so I can just survive. If you can take yourself out of that and say, you know what? I don't care what's around me. I'm going to put bread on my wife's table today. I'm going to go out and get it. I really think that you can find a ton of stuff in thrift stores and at garage sales and at recycling plants and on Facebook marketplace and at storage units. There's just so many ways to source. And I feel like we're just like, ah, my area just sucks. So I'm just going to go comment on Harry Tornado and J-Ride Flip's YouTube channel that they're only successful because of their area. I just don't, I don't know. Well, I think comfort and being content with things is good. But when it's not working out, that is a crutch. Holding yourself back towards something that you should be educating yourself on more things. I mean, you just mentioned it earlier, having this cell phone, Wi-Fi, um, and these being accessible to marketplaces, wholesalers, like you just got to think outside the box. 
use your smartphone, be just as smart as it, because if not, you're not, you're going to pretty much be dumber than your phone, where it's just waiting for you to use information for you to just use your little thumbs and start plugging in some keywords or think about what I've been telling people when they ask me about how do you sell things on offer up or find things like a Sony Trinitron, uh, Trinitron TV. Mm-hmm. I was trying to find That's these keywords that reseller uses, right? Sony Trinitron. And if I know those keywords and I know it's valuable, don't you think the person listing it knows it's valuable, right? And they're using in the model model number for it. They're going to know the value of it and they're going to have it priced at a price that you don't want to pay for. So you can still offer, you know, your price or ask them if it's still available and go through that whole route. But if you start thinking back of when we first started OTVs, box TVs, and you start putting in these normal wordings that resellers first started with before they started learning the jargon, I went on offer up and just put up OTV. And then I started putting keywords in Spanish and I found a Sony Trinitron within 30 minutes after this popping into my head for nine dollars, and I sold it right away. Let like, me let me uh, let me uh, say something that's going to negatively affect Archie Biscuit Butt. Love that guy, Archie Biscuit Butt on Facebook Marketplace has Mako, M A K O listed in the Facebook Marketplace, and he has it tagged. And every single time someone puts in baseball bat Mako. He's the first one on it and he drives over and he buys it because an Easton Mako orange bat sells for $150 in used condition. And a lot of people put them up for $5 or $10. And so he just goes and grabs them uh, kind of to what you're saying. You can just, if you just know what you're doing, you can really, really go get these items. You know? Well, you just ruined that for Archie. <laughs> uh, when, Back when I had two legs, I specialized in arcade games, and the hidden thing to finding arcade games really cheap was the word quarters. Mm-hmm. Because people who would, wouldn't would list things right, you know, they'd list old video game takes quarters or things like that. Quarters is the word that would pull up that $25 Pac-Man machine that's broken. But if you did that sort of thing, you always expect all of them to be broken. You just have to fix mm-hmm. them. But yeah, and there's all sorts of other keywords that will find anything that you're looking for that's not exactly the title for it. Yeah. And also, given another 10 years, every CRT TV will be valuable. Yep, exactly. And it's just like they shot up during the pandemic. They've come down. They're still selling well, but they've come down. They'll and go back up. And they're still getting junked in massive numbers. Yep. My, and... my thrift stores don't even put those TVs out anymore. They, they like I see them in the back and, they're, and I try to like, like make deals with them. And they're like, oh, sorry, we're not allowed to. We just don't put them out anymore. And people are still junking them when they instead of repairing them, if anything goes wrong with them. Yep. So yeah, they're just going to keep going up and up and up and up in value. Oh, and by the way, for you video game freaks who are buying those uh, those Sony pre- studio monitors to play your video games on, those things have 400 capacitors inside, and it will cost you about $1,000 to refurbish that thing. And the time will come. Those capacitors are time bombs because they wear out based on time. They could be sitting on the shelf and that suddenly you're going to have to drop $1,000 into that monitor. Just letting you know. And I, I actually wanted to get to this point a little bit later because I have a few more points about how to succeed physically in your area. But guys, do, do what we're saying right now. If you if you are having a really hard time in your area and you don't have to be a victim, I'm not saying that everyone's just like, oh, my area sucks and it's my area and eBay's fault that I'm not succeeding. That's not what I'm saying at all. A lot of people legitimately are trying out there. And they're just not hitting their goals or they're just not making enough money to make this worth it to them. And if you would, and you are doing everything you can to improve, but it's just not working yet. And sometimes you just need that nugget or you need that moment, that, that day where everything goes wrong and you're just like, you know what? I don't care anymore. I'm just going to do this. But if you guys are, if you guys are struggling and you're trying, this is some really good knowledge. What I just said about Archie with the Mako bat, sorry, Archie. Um, quarters to find Pac-Man and Vegas slots and things like that. I have keywords that I get emails from eBay almost daily when someone lists sunglasses that I'm interested in um, and they put sunglass lot, I get an email and I go check it out. I do that for handheld gaming units too. I get DSs and, and, uh, and, play, and uh, what's it called? Game Boys off of eBay all the time for $15 because I get it the second that it's listed and I sell it for 48 or even a hundred and stuff on Amazon. 
So if your area sucks, if you're convinced that it sucks, I still encourage you guys to keep getting better within your area, but go online, go onto eBay. Um, I figured out a way to make a ton of money buying things off of Amazon and selling them on eBay. I'll be making a video on that sometime soon. But if you have a computer and a smartphone in your hand and it is 2024, you can make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year every single year in e-commerce. You just, you just gotta develop the skills to do so. And that, that really is what my channel is going to be about for the next six months is, is helping you guys become skillful enough to go out and get $10,000 worth of product for 180 bucks off of eBay. Or if you don't want to make hundred thousands of dollars a year, you can make $50,000 a year and only work 12 hours a week. If you can, right. I'm glad you said that because people don't believe that. People don't believe you can do that in St. Louis. People don't believe you can do that okay. in a small town in Kentucky. People don't I believe like, you can do that. I, I make more than my wife does, and I am literally probably not spending more than 20 hours a week on reselling at this point. And I make more than she does. And you live in an area where arguably the thrift stores suck. Yes. Arguably your area sucks. Oh, no. Everybody, though, if you think your area sucks and you're having trouble at the thrift or the bins or the garage sales, bring somebody else with you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if they're good at reselling or they're bad. Suddenly they will be finding things that you were completely passing up. And try to bring someone who's different from you, i.e. if mm -hmm. you have a wife, bring your wife and she'll point mm -hmm. out the Revlon and the Urban Decay and she'll <laughs> point out the the weird vase that you know nothing about except for Sonny because he knows more about vases. Uh, than Two Face, Bobby Brown. Yeah, all that Sephora oh, stuff. One of my friends recently, he went with me to the bins and he picked up a couple of board games that were in Spanish. They were, I think it was very common games. It was like Life and Monopoly or something. Mm -hmm. what Ones that I would have passed by because my eye would have scanned and seen the box and not even looked yep. to see if it was in Spanish. I'd have seen the graphics in the box and say Life and Monopoly don't sell and walked right past them. And they sold it a lot for like $42 in two days. Mm -hmm. I also have, I, I actually have a video coming out today, I believe, um, that features Sonny and Carrie. Uh, when I went thrifting with you guys. And in the video, I'm, I'm talking about a ton of things that sell really well. And then I go live sourcing and I show everyone tips on what to find and what I'm finding. And then I say, and then also I went with two friends who even I get too narrow-minded, even though I say to look at everything and buy everything that's profitable. Here's my friend, Sonny, who specializes in glass and ceramics and stuff. And you showed this little dog that goes for $40 that I never would have, never would have been on my radar. And, my, and now here's my friend, Carrie, who specializes in sports cards and toys and action figures. And boom, he had some toys and action figures to show. So it, it's really important to, to expand your horizons. A lot of people think that it's like dumb to thrift with your competition or dumb to go to yard sales with your competition. But as an influencer, I'm learning firsthand. It's actually extremely beneficial extremely beneficial yeah. yeah it's it's healthy competition but it is not like you're out there to get over your friends you find what you find it's the first come first serve if you know what you're looking at because there's been a lot of times that i've overlooked things that friends are looking at stuff and vice versa we're looking in the same area but we're not seeing the same things for what we know the value is okay mm -hmm. And it can be anybody who help you. My wife finds things I wouldn't find. My 10-year-old daughter, or 11, oh gosh, she's almost 12. Either way, my daughter will find things. Friends who know nothing about reselling will pick out sometimes $100 items that I just strolled right past or pushed right to the side in the bins. Yeah. Also, next time one of you see Carrie, ask him why he's not buying collections. Why is not buying collections? Yeah. Why is he not buying sports card collections in the first place? That's how the sports card store makes all their money and gets all those cards in those bins for him to look through in the first place. Why didn't he just get the card store? <laughs> you, yeah, you used to work in a trading card store, right? Yeah, yeah. So I know how it works. The people are gonna bring, you know, they're gonna bring that card collection in, and I mean, yeah, yeah, you're gonna give them fifty cents a dollar on the big stuff, but the rest of it's gonna basically round down to zero. Carrie should be doing that. When, when I specialized in magic cards, that's what I did. Yep. I paid 50 cents a dollar on the big stuff, and the rest of it almost rounded down to nothing. Yep. I have some. I got to go through Magic the Gathering cards. Dude, Magic the Gathering, they're worth a penny, and then all of a sudden they're worth $5,000. And just right. like every, every other item, every other category, 
96% won't sell at all. 2% sells pretty well and 2% is amazing. And that's, that's our jobs as resellers to find that four or 5%. I wanted to bring up another topic. Um, and that is a lot of sellers that are, and I don't want to say complaining because I know that people are really trying out there and people are really just experiencing hardship, especially during the historically slower months of summer. And so I don't want to say complaining, but a lot of people that are talking about slow sales and giving up on eBay and you can't make it in my town or my zip code, a lot of times we get really stuck in doing what we just want to do instead of what's actually working and what's actually profitable. Now, this is not an advertisement for Deal Soldier. It's, uh, it's an app. It's a software that I use for retail arbitrage and things like that. It's helping me make a really good amount of money. <laughs> but you don't have to use Deal Soldier. You don't even have to use a software or an app. But if your thrift stores suck, why not, why not go to Walmart and get underwear for $3 that sells for $18 plus shipping? Why not, why not go to Home Depot and buy a Roy-V tool that is on clearance for $15 that sells for $85 plus shipping that will always, 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 always be in demand. Like power tools, you can't saturate power tools. That's you that cannot that do it. To zero. Yeah, that will never go to zero. And Makita from 1987 is still selling. Craftsman from, from 1895 or whenever they started is yes. definitely selling if you can find it. But we are so stuck on only listing CDs or only listing toys or only listing glass or only listing these things when there is golden opportunities everywhere. And it might be something that is pretty different. And I'm not saying that people have to do retail arbitrage, but all I'm saying is I am making a ton of money reselling used items and I am doubling my income also selling new items from retail stores. And whether my area is good or bad, Kohl's.com is available in every country except for probably Baghdad. <laughs> and actually, the more fun, the more fun something is to resell it, probably the less profitable it is because it just, okay. draws, just draws people to it. Like, I still don't, you know, the video game sellers, I don't get it. Yeah. You know, 10 guys running past things that are worth real money to knock each other over to buy a stack of PlayStation games they might get $25 for to spend $15 to do it. Sure. There's the gems in there, but, but. Yeah, always, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think, I think sometimes we just get too locked into, well, this worked 10 years ago or this worked 12 years ago or five years ago, or it's never worked, but I just really like it. So I'm going to keep doing it. You can, you can continue to do that, but I would also encourage people to add on a new arm to their business of hey you know what i'm gonna look at i'm gonna look at these other options i'm gonna go i'm gonna go to a recycling plant and put on a vest a, a shiny neon vest and i'm gonna go look for remote controls i have made thousands of dollars from that like i have found a ton of remote controls just going from a tin can and radiator recycling shop if it came down to it I could go knock door to door and say, hey, how's it going? I'll be quick. My name is Jake. Um, I have a thrift store and an online shop where I sell vintage electronics that have been sitting in your drawer for probably the last three years. I was just wondering if anything came to your mind immediately when I said that of something that you may be looking to possibly get rid of, like cameras or remotes, maybe watches. Um, I'm willing to pay top dollar for them and, and we can just discuss prices if anything came to mind. Oh, 98 people out of 100 are going to say, no, get off my porch. Two people out of 100 are going to say, yeah, I was actually just about to donate a few of my Walkmans and, and like Sony remote controls to Goodwill. Uh, you can just have them. Or yeah, you can have this box for $20. Like we, we're, I don't know, we're, we, we just really limit ourselves. But like you said, no one's tried everything. I've never heard of anyone doing that. And I, I promise that if you can get over the fear of that, you can be a millionaire this year. I, I really think you could be a millionaire this year doing that. <laughs> so there's so much good stuff out there. And if you just knock 600 doors a day, you can make a ton of money. That's the thing that most people won't do, though. They hear oh. their information and say, yeah, that's right. Who are self-proclaiming they, they don't have, they have the suckiest thrift stores, right? But they won't go out there and do it. 
You know, like you really have to step outside that comfort zone and do something for yourself rather than making complaints. And I was in the bad habit of that when I started reselling and being a content creator was the boohoo's. And then in time, I realized, like, I don't want to be stuck on a bad note. I want to have some answers or say what I'm working towards getting out of this. And I'm going to show you along. So it was more of like learning how to speak to people that watch me and have them involved in my journey rather than have everything just be one video and then it ends. And then it felt like I was starting over the next time. So I've learned how to communicate with people. And what I'm getting to is how to network with people. Jake and I have talked about estate sales and I will throw a nugget out there for those of y'all at the 50 minute mark right now. If you don't want to, if your areas suck, thrift stores, flea markets, whatever you have, but you know there are always houses being sold, I would get the realtor's information, any realtor out there, and say, hey, this is what I do. I'll clean out your areas mm -hmm. when they have it, and now you have no investment other than your time, all right? They might even be willing to pay you to clear out this stuff and still keep the free things that are in these estates or estates because you could flip it. That's a, that's a huge nugget a lot of people don't take advantage of. And I've learned here recently and I've been holding on to it, but I also don't want to hold on to things that jeopardize anybody like myself. But I don't think it does because there's so much homes. There's so much thrift stores. There's so much places. But if I'm willing to take the time to pick up the phone and call somebody, a realtor and say, hey, can you pass this on to other people? But you will have to get a business license. You will have to probably get certain permits or there's a little bit more to it. But mm -hmm. more than anything, they might just have some people to say, hey, come pick it up. I don't I don't really want anything other than you to clear this out. And I don't want anything else involved with it other than you help me clear this house and you get to get stuff for free. One of my best sources ever did does house cleanouts for uh various flippers mm -hmm. and landlords and whatever and i know she doesn't have a business license or anything they're just yeah. handing her cash to clean the house out and she'll bring me anything she thinks is valuable and i'll give her money now let me tell you guys literally how to do this again the average american currently has a car worth nine thousand dollars sell your car for nine thousand dollars Go buy a Chevy S10 from 1999 for $1,800. Then go buy a tiny, rickety, terrible looking trailer and go to people's houses and clean them. Like, look, you guys, like, a lot of people are like, oh, okay, well, maybe I'm upside down on my car loan. Maybe my car is worth 9000 but I still owe 16000 That's not a great place to be in, and I would still recommend sell your car. Uh, get that 9000 put it towards the loan, save up $1,800, go buy your Chevy S10, and then aggressively tackle that $7,000 left over on your Forerunner or whatever it was. And just just get to work, get gritty. Like, you know, like I knew, I, so I have, I, I, uh, we're, I think we're going to invite this person on the podcast eventually. I have a subscriber who listens to me say that once. He said that his eBay, he was, he was done with eBay. He did it in like, he did it in like 2007 and it was pretty successful and then stopped and then came back and then stopped and then came back. And this time he's like, you know, this time it's just like, it's too saturated. It's impossible. I'm just done completely. And I said, where do you live? Los Angeles, California. He literally, like, he literally had a car that was worth like $7,000. He sold it. He got a junkie. I think he ended up getting the Toyota T100 and he did exactly what I said and Dude, he's making so much money. And all, all it took was actually saying, you know what? I don't have the skill set currently, but here's the information. I'm going to go do it. And he, he just like didn't make excuses and he did that. And now he might make more money than I do every year. <laughs> like it's, but, but like, like Sonny said, like we aren't willing to do that. And if we can just look around and say, you know what? I'm willing to do it. Then we can all be, we can all be millionaires. We really can. There's a lot of money in this world. And if you can't find the S10, un American minivans are, can also be a really good value when they're old. Yep. Because S10s you don't, are you don't even need the trailer. Yeah. S10s yeah. are actually going up in value while the minivans are not. Yeah. Um, can I be pretty personal with you guys and with the audience? Um, I make a lot of money and I drive around a car that doesn't show it. And that one decision that I made a long time ago is one of the main reasons why I'm wealthy. 
I, I just made a sacrifice of buying a decent car that gets me from point A to B anyway, instead of going into debt to show people that I can afford a $17,000 car or a $35,000 car or a $60,000 car. Literally that one thing is the reason why I can literally stop doing what I want. I, I have you guys heard of fire? Um, it, it's this thing going around in the financial community. I can't remember the acronym exactly, but it's like sacrifice right now and retire early. Like literally just work your butt off until you're 32 years old and then you can retire because you ate, um, you didn't eat avocado toast. You never had a car payment and you worked 90 hours a week for 12 years and then you can retire. I, I could, I could do that today, but I, I won't. And I, I just feel like one of the answers to being successful on eBay is just getting out of debt, living below your means, and then just cash flowing your business. A lot of people think that their areas suck because of the stress of their car payment, because of the stress of coming home to a wife that is unhappy with them, because of the stress of their kids that are, that are struggling in school and they don't have the time to comfort them and counsel them and help them. And that's why their area sucks because they just have all of this fear and tension and anxiety and depression in their chest. And because of that, they can't find quality items on the internet or in their area. I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me on that, but I really encourage everyone to sell their car right now and go get a $2,000 or less car and do your research. Make sure that it's going to last for four years or it's going to last for 30,000 miles and you will become wealthy. It, like, I don't know. I don't understand how that one thing changes everything, but it does. No, it, it does because just your insurance and your property taxes alone on that expensive car, forget about the payment of the depreciation. It's probably as much as you're just going to spend to drive that hoopty all year, including, uh, including repairs. Mm -hmm. Like when I wanted to replace my van, I took, oh, my plates actually get five months expired because I wasn't going to buy the right deal until it came along. And I spent, Eventually $3,500 on a Jeep Commander that's 15 years old, but I thought it was a pretty great deal because it's an unpopular model, so it's cheaper than every other Jeep. And not having a car payment is just everything, and not having a mortgage is even better, mm -hmm. which I also am blessed enough to not have a mortgage anymore. Otherwise, I'd be thinking about moving to Florida too, but I'm not going to – the proper – buying a house in Florida is cheaper than renting in Florida from what I understand. No, I remember you talking I'm sorry, about sorry, it. It's the other way around. Renting in Florida is currently much cheaper than buying in Florida. Yeah. They have a flip I, I remember you I remember you talking about, hey, I have a mortgage, I'm gonna pay it off. You know? Yeah, and I did. You were you, you were just a big boy. You're just like, you know, I'm just I'm just gonna take care of business. <laughs> I'm just gonna sacrifice, I'm gonna take care of business, I'm going to to delay my gratification now and kind of live in an uncomfortable position. So that way if uh, I just can't find items in my area, it doesn't matter because I'm a free man. <laughs> and, uh, That's what cut my, why I was able to cut my work hours by half. And if anything, we've got more money now than we did then. Yeah. Well, we've definitely got more money now than we did then. So I don't know if you guys watched my, and I'm sorry, I'm talking so much, but this is just something that I'm super passionate about. Sorry guys. But uh, I don't know if you guys watched my latest live, but I asked AI to um, tell me about my channel. And it says that over the last six months, I've become much more brash and unempathetic. I, and I understand why it said that. Um, because I tell people that it's not their areas, it's them. And the reason why I truly believe that, we, we, we've talked about a lot of different things like the car and the cell phone and online buying things. But when it really comes down to it, it's because of your bad relationships with your spouse and with your kids and with yourself. And it's because you're making $8,000 a month, but you're spending $9,500 or you're making $3,000 a month, but you're spending $4,000. And that, that is the reason why our areas suck is because we are constantly in this state of fear. And it's not dramatic fear. We're not afraid for our lives, but our bodies are always just on autopilot of I have to survive and my car payment is this just chain around my neck and the fact that I can't tell my wife how much I make per hour or per, or per month is killing it's not it's not killing our relationship but it's it's making it a bit more tense than it should be and I don't know I, I, people people come to YouTube for the algorithm or for the nugget or for the bolo 
no one comes for the mindset of, Hey, listen, be a better person. And you'll, and you, you'll never struggle on eBay. But I wish, I wish that I could somehow communicate that, that I don't want to be brash and say, it's not your area. It's you. I want to say it in a loving way. I promise that if you can just improve yourself, your business will improve. Cause I don't know. Rant over. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It, it's, it's tough. And I do, I do understand the principle that some thrift stores are better than others. I do understand the principle that some areas are wealthier than others. Therefore the garage sales will be better or they'll be worse because people overvalue their items. I understand that some areas are poorer and so they're going to have lower prices at yard sales, but lower quality items. And it, it's just us up to us as resellers to identify the problems in front of us and then just, just tackle them and get over them. I actually like the lower income garage sale area. Oh, I, I love trailer homes. Yeah, you, you're, you're much more likely to find older items mm -hmm. than you are like, you know, in the brand new subdivision where Karen's ever the first garage sale and it's just a bunch of signs that hang on the wall that say gather. There's nothing for me there, but yeah. bunch yeah. of baby stuff. Yeah, live, laugh, yeah baby stuff. <laughs> yeah, live, laugh, love, baby stuff. <laughs> All of that. Yeah, no, I that's part, of the, um, that's part of the skill, though, of understanding new developments compared to older developments or even trailer parks, what you're going to find compared to the new homes of a lot of baby stuff. Is it worth your time? Probably not. It's still worth looking if you got the time. But that's the big difference of people who are understanding these little nuances of things to go for rather than I'm just going to go here and not think about what they're getting themselves into. If the thrift store is not working for you, why keep going through the thrift store? Or is it only because you're only looking in certain areas? And just like to tie in, segue a little few minutes ago of tools never really being oversaturated and bringing a friend with you. Art of Resale is a good example of that. You will see him with Paco, his brother-in-law, who's a mechanic who knows more than Art, but Art knows quite a bit of stuff himself. So now you got two people on the same team working for the same purpose, having a good time and bringing some money in off of things and bargaining at the same time because you got two brains. Two minds are better than one a lot of time when you're on the same page and have that support system that are in line with one another. No, and those two specifically are always having a good time. Oh, yeah. I, I hate that they never invite me. <laughs> Yeah, they always, they're always, uh, they're always haggling people down and, and sipping on something. They're all, they're, they're, they're I, I love, uh, I love Art and Paco. They're so rad. Oh, hey, one more thing. If you aren't Karen's first garage sale with all the live, laugh, love signs, one thing you can ask is you can just compliment her on her stuff and just say, I mostly buy collections of things that mostly men collect. Your husband got a basement full of anything you want rid of. Yep. And every once in a while that will hit. So I, I actually wanted to bring that up as well. So if your if your garage sales suck, um, I don't I hate editing GoPro footage into a video. I hate it. It's the worst. Um, so I'm I'm looking for someone that can just I can just send that footage to and they can edit it into a video for me. Yeah, because the majority of the things that I buy from garage sales are things that weren't outside at the garage sale. Um, I, so there's just so many parallels between business and entrepreneurship and industries. The best door to door salesmen go inside the house. If you're selling pest control, Oh, we have some ants. Oh, where are they? Do you want me to take my shoes off? No, you'll no leave them on. Come here. If you can get in the house, your chances of selling that pest control just went up, not double, like literally like 18,000%. You went from a one in 100 shot to like a one in four shot. Same thing, same thing at garage sales. The amount of houses that I actually go into, sometimes it makes my wife a little uncomfortable because she listens to a yeah. lot of murder podcasts. But the amount of houses that I go into, I'm like, oh, hey, um, you guys have this one Sony Walkman. Do you guys have any other like CD players or anything like that? Yeah. You want to see them? They take them in their house. That is, that is how you make money at garage sales. You can make a ton of money at actual garage sales, and then you can amplify the money you make. I'm saying, hey, do you guys have baseball bats or golf clubs? No? Okay. Oh, you have this camera here. Do you have any of those other ones? Oh, yeah, we have like six. We don't know what to do with them. Sweet. Can I see them? Right now? Yeah. 
I don't know. Maybe you can come back at the end of the day. No, I, I'd love to just see him right now. If, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a cool guy right here. I actually have the GoPro on. So like all this is recorded. You have nothing to worry about. Like I would love to like step inside and see your six cameras if that's cool. And a lot of people say no, but dude, seven people will say yes. And now you just made a ton of money from the yard sales that suck. Yeah, if they're willing to show you something, and even if they're not willing to sell it because they're attached to it in some way, I would still ask them along with your lines of, if you ever do consider selling these, I am interested. Here's my number if you want it. And you never know. They might come up a week later and say, you know what? I'm actually not using it. And this person's stuck in my head and it looks like they'll appreciate it. And it's not something I have to list or, or have sitting around and figure out how to sell it or go through eBay because there's a lot of people at yard sales, estate sales that will say, uh, yeah, here's the price on eBay. But do they do it? Nothing. Never got on eBay. Maybe then ordering things themselves. So those little things of asking. Would you take my number if you're interested in selling this? Or if you come across anything like this from your family or friends or neighbors or community art sales, you know, if you remember me, give me a text, you know, and usually the text is the best bet because a lot of people feel funny about calling Dave, AGH Dave is one that's more of a text person. And he feels like calling somebody uh, verbally talking to them is more like that's an old person thing. So you got to vibe with the person and you got to match them. And that usually does really good. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing I haven't done yet, but I plan on doing, I plan on getting business cards that says, hey, oh. I buy this. And if I do get in the house, and I don't want to sell it. Just tape that card to the box where the stuff say, I'm going to put this here in case you ever change your mind later. Yep. <laughs> I, I learned a gazillion things from sales that helped me in my business and in my personal life. Um, and here, here is, here is the uh, sales nugget of the podcast. The app people just say no as a common defense, even if they don't mean it. So in sales, if you're trying to sell someone an alarm system or pest control or um, solar, if you knock on their door, even if they kind of want it, you give them their pitch, they just re out of reflex say, now we're good, thanks, or no. Same thing at yard sales, same thing, everything. So what I learned over from over my years of selling door to door and selling internet and TV over the phone and, and selling everything is that people just automatically say no, just give them even one more opportunity to say yes. And a lot of times they will. So if you're in a garage sale and you're talking to someone and they're like, yeah, I have some more, I have some more video games in the house. And you say, Oh sweet. Can we go take a look at them? They're out of reflex. They're just going to be like, no, I'm good. And then you just use what's called an objection buster. <laughs> you just, you just, you get over the objection and just give them a chance to say yes one more time. If they say no, you can, you can leave. I push it for one more, <laughs> um, one more objection buster. And then they have another chance to say yes or no. And then I'm out of there. But if they say no, I don't know. Just give them a, just give them one more chance to say yes. Be like, yeah, I know. I know it's like kind of weird. Like just a, some, some guy coming up to you during your yard sale, but like if, if you just if you just give me a chance just to see them, I pay top dollar for these things. I'm actually really interested in them. I'd love to check them out. I don't know. It's just kind of yeah, I, I understand that it's weird. So I'll just ask you one more time if it's cool. Like I'd love to just see them. But if not, like, you know, I'll just get on to the next yard sale. And a lot of people are like, yeah, you know what? Like I'll, I'll go grab them and bring them out. Perfect. Thank you. I'll keep looking at your other items. But people just say no. They just say no. Just get over that first no. And we as the as the opportunist trying to get this stuff we also have these psychological and biological barriers that we don't want to put ourselves in an uncomfortable position to be told no so we don't ask in the first place you just got to get over that fear of being told no and then get over a second fear of being told no again and you will amplify your income like you never knew was possible i'm real chatty today even more than normal <laughs> Oh, uh, but yeah. Um, Paige, you got to get going in what? 30 minutes? Yes. Like, okay. Let's, uh, we, we've been going for an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, let's just kind of end here with, with a, a few of your last words. Um, I'll give you a chance to uh, plug yourself and advertise yourself, but just, just give us and the audience a few more of your like true opinions on how much your area affects, affects your success on eBay. Okay. I guess, uh, 
my biggest thing about high area effects for success on eBay is you may not want to specialize in something that's just bad in your area. Just because that's not going to work out best. Otherwise, as everybody said, you're going to be able to succeed anywhere if you do, if you do it right. And that's all I'm going to go away with. And just one other thing I want to mention, reason why it says making mistakes even ADH Dave never made is because I sold some boxes of cards on TCG Player the other day for a friend, didn't realize that I had my account set to pay out the store credit. So now I have to pay my friend for these boxes I sold for him, give him the money, and I've got TCG Player store credit, and I don't want anything from there. All right, let's go on down to Sunny. TCG Player is a really good app. You could scan your MTG Magic Deck Gathering cards, Pokemon cards, and uh, Yu-Gi-Oh cards. But I think Yu-Gi-Oh has their own app that's a lot faster from what I was told. Um, yeah, I, I really, like Jake, don't want it to be like, oh, it's an excuse of thrift stores sucking. If I know that and I know it's not doing well for me what I'm looking for, I've learned to just open up to get into other categories. And it has made a world of difference of having so much apparel laying around to now I don't have as much. And I'm a lot more organized with like last that's like right over here that's worth several thousand dollars collectively and is not taking too much space. And it's it looks a lot more appealing visually than how I had it before. And me just trying to figure it out, it's more on me and what I want. The things that sucked before was me not giving into opening up about learning. That's what really held me back. When I started opening up and learning more about myself and what I wanted from reselling, my world changed from something better. And it has helped my relationship with my wife, family and friends. Now I'm not um, embarrassed of like, don't go upstairs. Now I'm like, oh, it's not perfect. But now it's more I'm my comfortable, me being comfortable within my own skin of what I've done for myself and say, hey, come inside my office and check out what I have, you know, like, ah, oh, yeah, we could go in a garage now before it would be like, I would evade everything and go around. So thrift stores may suck, but it doesn't have to maybe if you open up to other categories. Bomsky. I want to say just one more, one more thing about this. Um, <laughs> I listen, I, I read, I read a lot of business and finance books. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I listen to a lot of billionaires and people significantly smarter than me. And I really, I truly do feel like it's rubbing off. Okay. There's this new thing again, get ready for a weird one. There's this new thing in the business and entrepreneurship industry called front loaders. Um, there's a lot of common con common personality traits amongst entrepreneurs. There's the risk takers, there's the planners, there's the go-getters, there's the workaholics, things like that. There's this new one mer emerging called front loaders where they front load and do everything possible to make their life easier and have more time to do what actually matters. So if you have a few tasks and one makes you the most money, two makes you a good amount of money, and then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 don't make you very much money, but they still need to get done. What these front loaders do is they tackle everything that doesn't make them a ton of money and gets them done as soon as possible. So that way they're not thinking about it in the future. For example, if I have a bunch of bills that I have to actually call the business or fill something out online, instead of doing that for 30 minutes a week, every single week of my life, I can just spend three hours, put everything on auto pay and have that completely taken care of for me. So I never have to do it again. And I can focus on making money in my business. What I'm getting at is if you guys want to succeed in your area and make more money than you ever have, you guys have to do more work. And it's impossible to do more work when you have debt and you have anxiety and you don't have a good, com good communication with your partner. One thing that will help you guys make more money in your area is having a hard conversation with your spouse or with your kids and saying, I've kind of messed up guys. I make a good amount of money, but I could make more money. And one of the reasons why is because I don't get up early enough and I don't drive far enough to get the product that I need to support us as a family. What I'm going to do is I'm going to communicate with you guys as, 
as much as I can and let you guys know for the next year, I'm probably going to work an extra two or three hours a day. So that way, 18 months from now, I can go to every single one of your soccer games and I can tell you how much money I make per hour, per day, per month. But we have to front load this stuff that is always taking up our mind space. And if we can eliminate those things, we can just go out and we can source and we can thrift and we can list items and we can ship them out and make more money. But that takes conversations with your family and it takes conversations with yourself of, you know what, I am living below my potential. I'm going to do the things necessary to go out and get them. So there's the, there's the weird rambly entrepreneur stuff. Well, guys, I love you all. I, I really appreciate you guys coming out and listening to the podcast. Thanks, Paige, for coming in. I, I just, I have this burning passion inside of me that tells me that you guys can just do anything in this life. And usually it's us that are holding ourselves back. So let's, let's, let's understand that our area could be holding us back, but we can overcome those and, and make more money. Paige, plug yourself, man. Hey, uh, Paige, One Foot Flipper. I'm One Foot Flipper on YouTube. I'm One Foot Flipper with an S on it on eBay if you want the real store. Otherwise, you'll get the car the all-card store, which is no longer gets any new items, but still makes $300 a month after expenses. So I'm not going nice. to shut it down. not going to shut it down, right? How many cards do you have in that shop? I have 11000 in the store. Oh, I've wow. still got about, about 2000 that I'm rotating in and out of drafts before they expire. So it does get refreshed via that way. And since the cards keep getting older, they do keep, it does keep making the same amount of money because the cards get ever so slightly more valuable as they get older. So it just keeps making the same amount of money. Good stuff. If that makes any sense. All right, I'm done. Sweet. Sonny, you got anything else to say? No, just, um, I would say don't, do your best not to stress about things. And when things aren't working out, forgive yourself and just make it that, fast as possible to not dwell on things that aren't working and remind yourself and look around of what the things are working on, be thankful for it and just keep thriving forward. Baby steps one day at a time, learn to beat yourself up less and learn to appreciate yourself more. That's what I'm talking about guys. We really appreciate you guys coming out to the Island today. Special thanks to uh, Paige once again. And uh, if any of you, influencer on youtube or not would like to be on the podcast comment below and uh, we'd love to have you guys on the island with us but or if you have any time, recommendations put them in the comments too yeah and if you have recommendations or if you want to reach out to your uh, favorite influencer if you or... want to go thrifting with me <laughs> Paige, i'm gonna go thrifting in st louis i want to make a video on it so okay we should go let's do it all right guys let us know in the comments below what your thoughts are we love you guys Thank you.